So the truth is that while there is untold devotion to Lady Zainab in the Shi Islamic world, there's disappointingly little academic research into her life. And that leads to substantial gaps in her biography. And biographical gaps quite often turn into myth. Now, myth is not a bad thing. The reason that people tell stories is because they have a certain regenerative power. But myth is always often the place where we build our golden calves, where we create spiritualities or we create theologies around people that make them untouchable, unreachable. The point about Lady Zainab is she is not unreachable. She is not inimitable or inaccessible. She is one of those exceptionally rare people for whom the world looks up from all its quarreling to see who this is who so blesses us, blesses our lives with her talent and with her imagination. One of those startling personalities who compels us or maybe compels me to ask how exactly my own life whatever talent or imagination may be present, how exactly my own life is adding quality to the lives of people around me. Personalities like Lady Zainab, the very best of people, the very best of the best, people who have experienced defeat, people who have been through suffering, people who have endured struggle, people who know what it means to keep on losing but have somehow found their way out of these things. People like that don't just happen. They have an appreciation and an understanding of life that gives them an empathy that other people just never find. So when I speak, as I do quite often, of a Zenabian praxis, what I really mean is a finding a way of representing the life of this extraordinary woman in a way that ordinary people like myself could emulate her, putting her back within the reach of ordinary people who are not necessarily engaged in great struggles for justice, because not all of us are, but who nonetheless every day have to deal with more ordinary and mundane things and are confronted even in the ordinary mundane moments of life with little moral choices, little personal stands for justice which frighten them but which have to be made. Certainly there are elements of Lady Zainab's life that are well known to us. The truth is that much of her life is trauma. It begins with trauma, the death of her grandfather, the prophet of Islam, in whose shadow of holiness she begins her own journey. And then the suffering inflicted on her mother, the Lady Fatima, immediately after the prophet's death. And then Fatima's subsequent death within months of her father, and then, eventually, the assassination of her father, Ali, and the assassination of her brother, Hassan, and later the assassination of her brother, Hussein. There's a great deal of trauma packed into the life of this woman from the beginning. And I would propose that at the core of Zainab's life, there are really two journeys that are made. There's, firstly, if you like, the historical journey. So this is the journey that takes place from Medina to Karbala and then from Karbala to Kufa, where she makes her first great stand for justice, and then from Kufa to Damascus, where she makes her second even greater stand for justice, and then from Damascus perhaps to Medina, or maybe to Egypt, or maybe back then to Damascus. That's the historical journey, but there's another journey that takes place in her life, and that is the existential journey. In the same way that Shariati talks about Fatima becoming Fatima, Zainab becomes Zainab. That's the existential journey, the, the moments of her life that are preparing her for this, this role that she was created for, even if, it, if it's at its heart, it's, it's a, 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 a role that lasts only a few days. It is without doubt a crucial role. And it's within that existential journey that the Lady Fatima becomes the exemplar, not just for women, not just for Shi'i woman, not just for Muslim woman, but for all kinds of people. She is a much more universal archetype, like her brother Hussein, who transcends the barriers and the boundaries of gender and culture and religion so that she becomes a paradigm 
for people who want to become what they were created to be. Now, we have enough biography to hear her authentic voice as it comes down to us through 1,300 years. And I would suggest you to begin this conference or to move forward this conference, I would suggest you that Zainab's voice is directed at three particular groups in society. I think in the first place, Zainab speaks to the traumatized because her own life begins and ends in great trauma. She speaks to the wounded. Why, why shouldn't she? If you had the capacity today to give life to somebody, to enable a single person to live their lives more intensely, more vibrantly, more abundantly, surely you would do it. And the truth is that we find ourselves confronted on an almost daily basis now with people who live with a sadness that runs down to their bones. Fragile people who have been utterly destroyed by life. Just too many dreams shattered or too many plans that have gone wrong or too many tragedies or too much trauma. And it's easy for us to say, oh, come on now, pull yourself together. But until we've experienced what it means to be utterly traumatized and to be lifeless, we can't reduce people's experience to a few platitudes. No, we have to shepherd people the way that Lady Zainab shepherded the surviving members of the Ahl Bayt in those dreadful days after Karmala, pulling, after Karbala, pulling them together and leading them. We have to shepherd people into a life that is more abundant because it's full of hope. And that hope that I'm talking about is not based on our ability for self-improvement. It's not a good feeling that tomorrow things are going to be better than they were today. It's not a hope that everything's going to be all right or that next time I won't mess up so badly. No, I'm talking about divine hope. That's a different thing altogether. She speaks to the traumatized. In the second place, I think she speaks to the wavering, to people who are faced with daily ethical decisions that absolutely terrify them because they don't want to be unpopular. Little stands for morality or for justice that paralyze them or people who face the struggle with the truth that demands to be told and they don't want to tell it. The very fact that you went to Karbala, those interventions, three or four of them, on the actual battlefield during the battle. This astonishing stand she takes before the two great tyrants of her day. And then this crushing indictment of Yazid's leadership was much, much more than speaking truth to power. It was about speaking a radical truth, not just individual truths or particular truths, not just religious truths or political truths. We have plenty of those. No, we're talking about the truth. If the senses and the nerves of my hand begin to tell lies, if they begin to send messages to my brain, telling my brain that something that is hot and untouchable is in fact cool and touchable, there is no way I can survive. People need truth. Communities need truth in order to have any chance at life at all. Radical truth in everything we say, but also in the way we think things through, and the stances we take, and the actions that we perform, not just in public, but also in private. But telling the truth in that radical way is a difficult work. It takes a lifetime of practice. And sometimes, as Zainab found, radical truth leads to great conflict. But communities and people can't live without it. Zeynab was not a woman who practiced male virtues. Courage and a certain oratory that is daring when it comes to the truth and a dauntlessness in the face of a tyrant, these are not male virtues, these are human virtues. And the reason that Zeynab caused Ziyad to back down and won Yazid's exceptionally grudging admiration at the end was not because she was brave like a man, but because she spoke a radical truth, saying what had to be said, even at great cost, because that's how Zainab remembered who she was. That's how people discover the shape of their own hearts when they say what has to be said. You will have heard, you will continue to hear today, commentators, I'm sure, talking about Zainab as she speaks to the traumatized and to the wavering in society. But there is a third group 
And that's the group of people who live on the fringes of what society now regards as significant, as possessing any value. I'm speaking about the elderly. I'm speaking about people among us who have grown frail under the burden of years, but who somehow continue to anoint our lives with their wisdom and with their faith and with the, mm, the grace of the sacrifices that they've made. Men and women of a certain age whose patience with God and whose patience with themselves must surely challenge us. I know that society thinks it is the young who are models of vision and vigor and imagination, but sacred history thinks differently because God over and over again chooses men and women who are already advanced in years to help move forward the story of this great divine intervention in our world, senior citizens from whom we can gain so much insight that has been aged and matured. The very fact that one of the central characters on the field of Karbala was a woman who was no longer young must surely consistently challenge all of those places and all of those situations where elderly women are disregarded or downgraded or sidelined or just not valued as persons. Zainab is incarnate in every grandmother who you know and in every mother too. Those grandmothers and mothers of our communities whose stories we don't even know, those invisible women of our communities whose great lifelong battles were not as public as Lady Zainab's battle, but who nonetheless fought against tyranny just as she did, the tyranny of a society that repeatedly marginalizes the elderly, freezes them out, and just ignores their hard-earned dignity. Our communities are not short of widows, elderly women who use an enormous amount of energy trying not to let on, trying not to let on how reduced their income is or how tiny their pensions have grown, or how the inheritance is beginning to dwindle, and how they've been reduced to a certain scarcity in life, how things begin to wear out that can't be replaced, so that they begin to look a little raggedy, how their social life has begun to wither, how they've lost every sign that once they did have a good life, how the children are long grown up, not as happy as their mothers would hope they would be, not as attentive, maybe not as nearby, how the family home has begun to fade and leak and need replacement of things that widows don't understand. To be elderly, to be poor, to be a widow is to be on the edges of society, to be invisible. In fact, in Hebrew, the word for widow means the silent one. There is a hadith that reads, I'm going to try it in Arabic first, that reads, Asa'i al armalati wal miskin kal mujahid fi sabilillah, aw kaladhi yasumu al nahar wa yakumu al layl. The widow, the one who looks after the widow or the poor person, is like a warrior who fights in the way of God like a person who fasts the whole day and then stands in prayer the whole night. So I, I hold before you all the mothers and the grandmothers you've ever known, women of such fierce belief and faith who have held on often with whitened knuckles in the face of everything that is against them. Zainab represents them all. Maybe Zainab challenges us and maybe even indicts us with a voice as fresh as it was when it echoed through the courts of Yazid, challenges the way we understand what truthfulness is when it becomes radical, telling the truth as it is in the present. Because if Zainab functions as the archetype of defiant resistance against every injustice, then she shows us, as does the whole of Karbala, that truth, no matter how bruised or battered or bloodied it may be, no matter how broken it is, always ends in victory. She, she forbids us, all of us, ever to forget Karbala. I know that Karbala amongst the Shia has never ever been understood as a once for all event. It's always been understood as a, a place that people inhabit, as an occurrence that people constantly renew. 
I think the Karbala is an event that sketches out a space for people in which they can live lives that are prolific and constructive and meaningful. God, if you like, has written the word Karbala onto the human heart, written it deeply into people's lives, and their consciousness has used Karbala as the pen by which he's inscribed into humanity the capacity for justice and courage. Lady Zainab reminds us of this and forbids us to forget it. But most of all, let her remind us of those mothers and grandmothers of faith who still live among us, still ready to hope in the values and ideals that a younger generation quite easily discards. I hope that her voice, her presence, will weave themselves into the fabric of everything that is discussed this afternoon. Thank you.